good morning to all of you let's get started with the 32nd lecture which is a continuation of turbulent flow which we discussed in the last class and if you remember the last class we said that even in a turbulent boundary layer there is a small layer adjacent to the boundary where the flow is laminar and you call that laminar sublayer and even the turbulent flow that you have on top of the laminar sublayer the boundary is not very smooth rather it is very uh, rough and this position goes on changing so on an average we said where the boundary lies which uh, demarcates turbulent flow from non turbulent flow and uh, after that we also had a look at the features of a laminar boundary layer velocity distribution compared to that of a turbulent velocity distribution the velocity distribution in case of turbulent flow will always be fuller reason being there is a more intense exchange of momentum between layers so there is a tendency for the velocity to become more uniform now even though the boundary layer is very thin when you do the analysis of the boundary layer you need to make more subdivisions that itself is thin yet in the thin layer you have to think in terms of different kinds of zones and that is what we are going to discuss today ok. So first of all let us consider a smooth boundary and what happens in the laminar sublayer that is what you would like to focus first alright. Now in the laminar sublayer I have given a typical velocity distribution in the laminar sublayer no doubt there is a small variation however because this thickness is so small in this small zone you can approximate this curve by a straight line meaning within the sublayer thickness delta prime you are assuming that the velocity variation is linear if that be the case what happens to the shear stress within the laminar sublayer given by Newton's law of viscosity tau equal to mu du by dy and if the velocity distribution is linear what happens to this ratio du by dy how can I approximate that u by y du by dy is same as u divided by y so that is why tau 0 that is one part so here whether throughout this laminar sublayer tau is a constant and will also be equal to the boundary shear tau 0 hence in the laminar sublayer we are able to write tau 0 is equal to mu times u by y or try to rearrange this divide both sides by rho mu by rho becomes nu kinematic viscosity into u by y now here there is a very important parameter which is by definition u star called the shear velocity and what is it equal to square root of tau 0 by rho the importance of this parameter is that it will be appearing almost in all the relationships that you are going to develop so this is called shear velocity it is only by definition root tau 0 by rho because it is derived from tau 0 it is here since you check the dimensions of this it will come out as length over time that is that of a velocity that is why it is given a name shear velocity it is not that it is flowing nothing is flowing just a name given as shear velocity ok. Now therefore tau 0 by rho is u star square equal to nu into u by y again rearrange this write u by u star equal to 
y u star y nu. So this simple relationship is recast in a little different form, the purpose of which will be clear little later. Okay. So in the laminar sublayer, what is the velocity distribution given by that is u by u star equal to y u star by nu, which is nothing but a little more modified form of the relationship tau 0 equal to mu into u by y. Next comes what happens in the turbulent zone, this is all right for laminar sublayer. Now how to handle the turbulent flow, now to handle the turbulent flow a hypothesis was proposed by Prandtl in 1925 and it is analogous to theory of gases. There is a difference in the theory of gases, you assume that the molecules have a mean free path which goes on changing, it is all random, but on an average you have a certain mean free path. Similar to that, here also in fluids you assume that lumps of fluid, not molecules, lumps of fluid travel to a new environment and something happens, that is what we are going to see. So that is why we say it is analogous to theory of gases and this is the in simple form, this is what it means. Theory assumes that a lump of fluid retains its identity over a certain transverse direction, means flow is taking place this way. The assumption is there is a lump of fluid which moves in the transverse direction by some distance and as it moves, it retains its original momentum. Then when it comes to the new layer, then it gives that momentum to the new environment and that will cause a change in the momentum and also a cause in the velocity, that is what we are going to see. Now okay, approach it loses its momentum to the surrounding. This is applicable primarily to simple cases where one shear component is important because you will be only modeling one shear component whereas in actual turbulent flow you will have so many six components. If you remember Reynolds those additional stresses that come, there are three diagonal terms, normal stresses and then six shear stresses. So that is a very complex thing, but this is very you know useful when you have a one component. Now this hypothesis has been found to be very useful for many engineering applications. There is a little hitch here that is theory assumes that mixing length, what is mixing length? The transverse direction which the lump travels retaining its original momentum that length is called the mixing length. So here the mixing length and because of this mixing it causes diffusion that is what you call the eddy diffusion because it is uh, resulting due to eddy motion you give a name eddy diffusion depends on local conditions in the flow. This also will be clear in the next stage. But importantly it is not a property of the fluid, it is all a property of the flow itself which we are trying to find. So that is where the difficulty arises. Now there are many discussions, you will find many criticisms saying that it does not adequately represent the correct physical picture of structure of turbulence. These days you have a lot more sophisticated models. Now when I say models, what is the basic aim of a turbulence model? The basic aim of a turbulence model is to connect the turbulent shear stresses with the mean flow properties, mean velocities. So that is what is the aim and you have different models. This was the simplest introduced in 1925. These days you have lot more sophisticated models which will tell you more about the features and the structure of turbulence. They are complex, but these days you have good number of softwares available to you through which you can solve 
and get more details about the turbulent features of a boundary layer. However, for engineering practice, although we get a lot of criticism, this mixing length hypothesis has been found very useful. So, people fall back again on a theory which many consider is by accident it is working, not that there is any great you know mechanism, but it works. That is why it is very popular and is applied in many engineering applications. Okay. Now, let us see what we said here, how it uh, really affects your flow. So, this is the velocity profile at any height y, the velocity is u, okay. This is this distance from here origin to that place is y and this is your velocity which is a function of y. Now, if you look carefully over a short distance or over a mixing length, if the fluid particle moves from this level to this or it comes from here to here, what happens to the change in velocity delta u? What what is the difference in velocity? Obviously, if you assume the Taylor expansion take only the first term, you will get that the difference in velocity between this level and this level will be equal to L. L is this distance multiplied by du by dy. So, is the case on this side. Now, other interesting feature is if there is a V prime coming down means it is a negative one as it reaches the new environment, since it is coming with a higher momentum and then adopts to the new one, it will generate a fluctuating component in the new level and that will be higher than what was existing the velocity because it is carrying higher momentum to this level. So, a negative V prime will generate a positive U prime. Reverse is the case, if a lower momentum goes that means V prime is positive here. Since it is coming with lower momentum in the new environment, it will result in a uh, negative value of the velocity, new velocity. So, always a positive one results in negative U prime, a negative one results in a positive U prime and the product u prime v prime will be finite quantity and will be positive. Okay. Now, if you again remember from your Reynolds equations of motion, we said what was the turbulent shear stress generated which was equal to minus rho u prime v prime that comes in the equations when you make use of the fact that the instantaneous velocity is equal to u plus u prime. So, we have derived that in the last lecture and so turbulent shear equal to minus rho u prime v prime. Now, for u prime v prime another assumption that he had to make is that the fluctuating component is proportional to the difference in velocity that exists between the two layers which also makes physically sense if there is a big difference if this lump comes obviously it will create a bigger fluctuation that is one assumption. Second assumption the V prime that gets generated is almost similar to U prime okay U prime V prime because even in continuity equation you get a feel that the terms are not negligible okay. So, V prime is of the order of U prime then since u prime is of the order of delta u, v prime also will be order of delta u, where delta u stands for L du by dy. Therefore, what will happen to your turbulent shear stress? Minus rho u prime v prime, if I substitute all this in terms of this, it becomes rho into L square du by dy, a product comes so square. But once it is square, it is very difficult to keep track of the sign of the shear, meaning whether you have velocity profile like this, you could also have a velocity profile like this. 
each one will produce a different kind of a shear positive or negative. So, to take care of that finally same thing we are writing as tau top length equal to rho L square absolute value of 1 du by dy into du by dy. So, that du by dy will take care of the sign of the shear that exists in the fluid. Now, you remember what was Boosnius approximation what we also spoke earlier that similar to your laminar shear stress where you write Newton's second law mu du by dy. You also made an attempt to write that the turbulent shear stress is equal to instead of mu eta okay, some other viscosity we call eddy viscosity into du by dy. Therefore, comparing this with that presentation that tau t equal to eta into du by dy it means the eddy viscosity eta is rho into L square d y d y. So, if you have a look at this the earlier statements that we made in the slide that is a local phenomena makes sense because d y d y is local depends on where you are. Even the mixing length also is a local phenomena depending on how far you are from the boundary that is what we will do in the next stage. So, it is a local phenomenon and it is very difficult to really get a clear idea as what is going to happen here or how this will help you to derive the velocity profile. Okay. Now, you realize see how many assumptions we are going on making first it retains its original momentum then comes these assumptions then some more assumptions in the boundary layer. Okay. Now, here this little diagram is quite uh, important. If I plot the variation of th this is the boundary layer thickness from here to here okay. and if you plot the variation of shear over the thickness of the boundary layer how does it look like. Okay. Now, this solid line which I have shown here represents the total and in a boundary layer it has been observed that over a small thickness and this thickness is approximately 15 percent of the boundary layer thickness delta or 0 0.15 times delta this thickness. Total thickness is boundary layer thickness out of which over a small thickness here close to the boundary the shear stress remains nearly constant fine that is one second. There is a dotted line you will find here and earlier we have discussed that the shear stress in the fluid is equal to total shear is equal to tau turbulent plus tau laminar and in a turbulent flow the tau turbulent part is very large compared to tau laminar. So, what does this dotted line then represent the tau turbulent. The difference between the dotted line and the solid line represents the laminar shear which is a very small quantity. So, the turbulent shear is almost equal to the total in most of the thickness in the boundary layer turbulent boundary layer. Now, as you come closer what happens to your turbulent shear stress remember turbulent shear stress arises because of the fluctuations. Now, if you are coming very close to the boundary what will be the fate of these fluctuations they will have to get dampened out fluctuations which is a property of turbulent flow. So, by the time you enter the laminar sublayer, these fluctuations have to vanish. If it vanishes, what happens to your turbulent shear stress gets smaller and smaller, and on the boundary it is 0. So, the dotted line, as you see, as you come closer to the laminar side, it starts deviating from the total, 
and the difference between the, this dotted line and this is large expected reason being that is all due to viscous action and finally the dotted line joins here becomes 0. So that is one part of the story. The other part of the story which is more important if you are very observant here is what assumption can I make regarding the tau turbulent in this zone of 15 percent delta is there in the picture all that you have to do is tell me in statement form what assumption can I make as regards tau turbulent in this zone which is only 15 percent of the boundary layer thickness delta. So you are going to assume that tau turbulent is a constant okay and is equal to tau 0 which is the boundary shear is it okay tau 0 is the boundary shear and the way it is plotted here and you saw the difference you can make assumption that in that 15 percent of the boundary layer thickness the turbulent shear stress remains constant and is equal to the boundary shear stress tau 0. So this is what is written here the explanation of this diagram is contained here in a equation form tau 0 is equal to tau turbulent and what was tau turbulent from mixing length hypothesis rho into L square du by dy into d by dy is it okay. Now although you came to this stage still there is a problem. The problem is you do not know about the behavior of the mixing length L. So one more assumption. So the assumption is Prandtl assume that the farther you are away from a boundary the mixing length will be larger or the mixing length is a linear function of the distance y that is what you write mixing length is the constant of proportionality is kappa this is a kappa Greek letter kappa times y okay and in the above expression tau 0 gets this tau 0 by rho becomes u star square L square becomes kappa y whole square this is du by du whole square or simplify this what will I get if I integrate that take the square root and integrate you will get u by u star equal to 1 by kappa log y plus some constant. Now this being a logarithmic distribution you run into problems again. The problem is you cannot extend this relationship to y equal to 0 because it is logarithmic and also physically you should not make y equal to 0 because near the boundary the flow is no more turbulent remember this is valued only for turbulent flows whereas there is a laminar sublayer. So it does not also make sense that you can simply go to y equal to 0 and apply a boundary condition you cannot do that. So because of the logarithmic nature of this distribution the mean velocity can be considered as 0 at some finite value of y equal to y prime you do not know what that y prime is but you will consider that at y equal to y prime let the velocity be equal to 0. In fact if you have the distribution it will pass to y prime go to minus infinity okay but minus infinity part is of no relevance to you okay. So once I put back here write it back again in a compact form u by u star works out as 1 by kappa log y by y prime. So next stage is how to find y prime. So here comes some intuition. Now this distance y prime should depend on a combination of the viscosity of the fluid as well as the shear stress or shear velocity that exists on the boundary. 
Now, if you look at the dimensions, what was the dimension of no kinematic viscosity L square by T? Dimension of U star is L by T. So, if I take the ratio, you get a L, and that should really be the combination. That is how you get an idea what should be the combination. It is not the other way around U star by nu, then it will be something different which will not come a linear dimension. So, the dimensional analysis comes very handy and from these arguments, simple arguments, you get a feel that y prime should be related to nu by u star. This is a length dimension, this is also length dimension. So, now you substitute for y prime in the above logarithmic distribution and then you change also the natural log to log 10 which is more convenient to use okay for calculations. So, if you do that, that becomes 2.3 instead of 1 by kappa it becomes 2.3 log to the base 10 y u star by nu plus some constant. Now, these constants have to be found from exponents. All that you are saying is something is proportional, but ultimately those constants will not come out unless you conduct careful exponents and find what should be these constants be okay. Now, this kappa is known as Kalman's universal constant, but experiments show that it is not really a constant there is a small variation okay and it varies depending on the flow condition, but the variation is fairly small. So, for all practical purposes kappa could be taken as 0 0.4. So, if I put those values here, see the all these adjectives are very important, do not forget for the inner turbulent region of the boundary layer. That means, the boundary layer is divided into two regions, in fact three. One is your laminar sub layer, then the inner region turbulent part and beyond that is called outer. So, do not mix up this outer zone with the outer zone on top of the boundary layer because so it is we are only talking about the boundary layer now ok nothing beyond that. So, if I take this empirical values of kappa and b are substituted you get u by u star equal to 5.6 log y u star by nu plus 4.9. However, this is more common if kappa is taken at 0 0.4, then these numbers will change and this is what is a very popular expression in a boundary layer u by u star equal to 5.75 log y u star by nu plus 5.5 ok. Now, keeping this in mind, if you go back to your laminar sub layer, what is the commonality? I am just keeping this so that you have a look at this. This was for laminar sub layer, this is for that zone on top of the laminar sub layer, but within 0.15 delta. So, what do you find? If you, what would I say? Put it in a functional form if I want to write what can I write based on these two equations? u by u star, it is not difficult, it is there right away, only you have to be alert, u by u star, something log y u star by nu plus 5.5, here u by u star is y u star by nu, ok. So, what can I write in general u by u star is a function of y u star by nu. What that function is differs from zone to zone, but if you combine both the conclusion is that in this 15 percent thickness and the laminar sub layer taken together you have u by u star is a function of y u star by nu. Now, what that function is given here for turbulent flow this is the one 
for lamina flow u by u star equal to y u star by nu. Is it okay? This is a general statement. Now, if I plot these relationships on one axis, you have y u star by nu, other axis is u by u star. Okay. Now, in the laminar sublayer thickness, you had u by u star equal to y u star by nu, which was a linear relationship. But when I plot it on this graph, it has become a curve. So, are you able to realize why u by u star is equal to y u star by nu in the laminar sublayer zone, right? But on the graph or in the graph, what I show is this is a curve. It's nothing, there is nothing big about it. Had I been plotting that in a natural way, it would have come a linear. Because here, this is semi log. This is natural, this is log. That's why this graph is a semi log plot. So, even that straight line gets curved automatically, that's all. So, nothing different than what we said for laminar sublayer. But what is the why do I have to plot it on a semi log plot? Because the second part which we derive u by u star equal to 5.75 log y u star by nu plus 5.5. There u by u star I am putting in natural on the other side log y u star by nu. So, if I plot that what should I expect then? A linear relationship. So, this is the turbulent part, this is the laminar part okay? and you will find that around why you start by nu equal to about 4 or 5. It starts deviating from this curve and gradually joins this. Why does it happen so? Because this represents a laminar flow, this represents a turbulent flow and the change over from laminar sublayer to turbulent cannot occur all of a sudden. Rather things have to change gradually from laminar flow to turbulent flow. That is the reason why this starts deviating and finally joins this. So, the real curve is in fact this much, this and this. This part is the logarithmic part, okay? logarithmic distribution. Whereas, this is your laminar sublayer and when y u star by nu is approximately 4 or 5, some books take 4 or 5, it does not matter. If I take laminar sublayer relationship as the zone where u by u star is y u star by nu is valid and I say that it starts deviating at y u star by nu equal to 4. From there, can you tell what is the laminar sublayer thickness? Laminar sublayer thickness. So, what we are trying to say is in the laminar sublayer, the limit of this, limit of this is y u star by nu equal to 4, right? Limit y into u star by nu equal to 4. Now, if that be the case, that is the limit beyond which it starts deviating. So, what would this y represent then? Thickness of the laminar sublayer. Therefore, y takes the role of delta prime. From here, you would get delta prime is equal to 4 times nu by u star. Is it okay? So, if you know u star, you know viscosity, you can always make an estimate about the laminar sublayer thickness which comes out as 4 times nu by u star. But if you do not really worry about these zones, what are the three zones now? One is laminar sublayer, one is turbulent zone and the transition between this to this is what is known as the buffer zone. 
and what is the extent of the buffer zone? Buffer zone starts from 4. Why you start by why you start by null equal to 4 and to about maybe here in the diagram it is about 10, 20, 30, so about 30. Some books take 70, it does not matter. So, from something you are going to here and this is what is called the buffer zone. Here in fact in taken 70. So, this is the buffer zone, lamina sublayer, the buffer zone followed by a turbulent zone. But keep in mind although the figure looks little big and so on, all this distance you are talking about is within that 15 percent of delta. Okay, so, 15 percent of delta is again subdivided into zones, lamina sublayer zone, a buffer zone on top of which turbulent flow. Okay. Now, instead of making this point, the lamina sublayer thickness to coincide with this point, people thought why not we simply have two zones, a lamina sublayer and a turbulent. That means what do you do? You extend this curve, extend this curve and wherever it intersects that value comes out as 11.6. So, often you will find in the computation of laminar sublayer thickness, delta prime will be equal to 11.6 nu by u star. That is the rough estimate, but it is very popular. Whereas, this really gives the actual thickness. So, keep in mind that if I make use of 11.6 nu by u star as an estimate for laminar sublayer thickness. I am really thinking about a number which is almost three times larger than what you really have. Now, what is the role of this here itself? We will try to cover up. Supposing I have an estimate about the laminar sublayer thickness delta prime does not matter whether you call 4 nu by u star or 11.6 nu by u star. How will that help you to classify the nature of the boundary meaning whether it is a smooth boundary or a rough boundary. So, the physical interpretation is if your roughness heights projections are smaller than the sublayer thickness then the outer flow does not really feel the presence of this roughness and you call it is a smooth boundary, hydrodynamically smooth. Whereas, if the projection heights are fairly large compared to your laminar sublayer thickness, then you say that the boundary is behaving like a hydrodynamically rough boundary. Is it okay? All right. Now, next comes how are we going to handle the balance 85 percent? This only is talking about the zone close to the boundary which is roughly 15 percent, but still you are left with 85 percent of the boundary layer. Now, how to get a velocity distribution in there? So, based on physical arguments, you have some other kind of a law which is called the velocity defect law. What is the velocity defect? You see this quantity capital U minus small u, small u is the actual velocity, capital U is the approaching free stream velocity. So, difference between that and the actual is the defect that much you lost. That is why it is called a velocity defect. So, your argument is beyond this 15 percent the velocity defect or how much velocity reduction is taking place will depend on the uh, shear stress that you produce okay, that is boundary shear rather than how it is produced. When I say how, if it is a smooth boundary the shear stress that you produce is due to viscous action. If it is a rough projection then shear stress that you produce is to do something else roughness elements. 
we will come to that later when we talk about drag, suppression of flow, etc. Now, irrespective of what happens near the boundary, the outer zone, when I say outer zone beyond this 15 percent, should not feel how it has been generated, rather, it will feel only on depend only on the magnitude. So, with that argument, okay, as I said, this shear could be due to viscous action or in case of rough boundaries due to flow separation over the rough elements. So, dimensionally arguing about this case, I can write u minus u by u star is a function of y by delta and this is what is called the defect law. Now, you might wonder can I not get this same thing if I extend the log relationship this log relationship I can use it at any y I can also extend boldly for y equal to delta strictly speaking it is not valid, but I may think why not I go on applying. So, if I do that you apply u this when I take y equal to delta what will be the corresponding velocity capital U. So, if I take the difference then also you will end up with a similar formula it is ok, but this is the real argument to come up with this and with kappa equal to 0 0.41 exponentially found values in a boundary layer or ok. If it is if it is less than 0 0.0.15 this is the relationship if it is greater than it. Now, this might be confusing to you a bit because we said the defect law is valid beyond 0.15 delta still I am writing here that if it is less than this I am writing the defect form with a different constant. The idea is although these were derived for different zones it is found that you can make use of the logarithmic distribution right up to the top although your assumption is not valid. Similarly, the defect law that you have the defect law although it is valid at the top can also be extended down below that means there is a overlap although the arguments were there to develop a logarithmic distribution only for a limited zone it is found that you can also extend it right up to delta y equal to delta. Similarly, although the velocity defect law was meant for the top zone not the bottom 0.15 that also you can do and by doing so you will end up with slightly different coefficients that is why I have written these two otherwise if you are very strict this should not appear at all because we are talking about velocity defect law which is valid for y by delta greater than 0 0.15 is ok. So, that means finally with all this exercise you come up with velocity distributions a defect law a logarithmic distribution then the law of the wall. So, here the validity of this can be given from experimental data. Now, I have not shown here the experimental data, but the experimental data come very close to this curve which the same same curve which I have given here they are plotted here you see up to 15 percent this is the point this is a logarithm scale 0 0.1 0 0.2. So, it is somewhere 0 0.15 this is the inner zone here the outer zone. So, here that relationship is this this, but they are both defect law because you are representing capital U minus small u by u star as a function of y by delta the function could be different. So, finally, all this works out very well and experiments also show that this curves that you develop they are quite 
acceptable for engineering application. But uh, still you might be wondering why do we have to do all this and uh, how is it related to flow through pipes. See flow through pipes in our course is a different chapter. But the way I am trying to connect the two is if you understand the boundary layer thoroughly, interpreting the results of friction factor in a pipe will be very easy, more meaningful. Otherwise, you will be doing it mechanically, just using a graph, maybe Moody's diagram and doing it. But if you follow all these things, logically you will find that these results are subsequently made use of in deriving friction factor for pipes. Okay. So, the derivations will not be covered, but I will tell you the you know the steps starting from here what you get starting from there what you get and finally, you have a resistance law Karman's Cantor Karman's resistance law and that is what we are looking for. So, this is the velocity distribution in a boundary layer smooth boundary. And uh, when it comes to rough boundary, when it comes to a rough boundary that y prime, remember what is y prime? That is value of the logarithmic distribution where the velocity is 0, it is not on the boundary. Now, for a rough boundary, this y prime has been found to be equal to k s by 30. So, if you just put the value there. Okay, y prime and get it, you will have a, again a logarithmic distribution for a rough boundary. Okay, that we will do in the when we talk about the velocity distribution in a pipe and then the, the turbulent boundary. But before we close today's session, tell me I have discussed this earlier, but I am asking you if you have flow through a pipe. And if you want to make use of this boundary layer relationships, what is the one to one correspondence? Meaning, I give you the diameter of the pipe, okay, and then ask you what is the boundary layer thickness in a fully developed zone? What is the boundary layer thickness for a pipe? I have explained all that only probably a handful would remember. So, the boundary layer thickness will be equal to radius of the pipe. So, this rod radius of the pipe will be treated as the boundary layer thickness. Then the free stream velocity capital U, what will that be in a pipe? This center line velocity, okay. So, that is what is the other change. Now, why do people want to switch over? from one to the other kind because as you see here in all these relationships you need u star and what is u star? It is square root of tau 0 by rho that means I need to know tau 0 boundary shear. Now measuring boundary shear is not an easy job for a flat plate okay. People have made attempts to measure it directly, indirectly and so on but it is a difficult job. However, if it is a flow through a pipe, can you measure tau 0 easily and if so, how? We will come to that little later, but immediate just as a little introduction. Can I find out tau 0 boundary shear acting on a pipe? I give you hints, okay. At the two sections, I take the piezometric heads or the drop in pressure. If I know the drop in pressure, can I find tau 0? Okay, you think it over. How will you find? 